for this morning. You know, we've been covering this passage, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, for several weeks now. We're going to finish up this morning, and I hope uh, next week, I really, one subject that's been rolling around in my heart is the chastening of the Lord, so I hope that we'll get into that out of Hebrews chapter 12 next week. But here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, let's read it one more time. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And in that verse, there's no gray area. There's no such thing as keeping one step, one foot in the church and one foot in the world. One foot in the kingdom of light, one foot in the kingdom of darkness. It cannot be done. God commands our all and our total, absolute surrender. And if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. And so the reason why we've been going through and studying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is to guard our hearts and to make sure that we're free from carnality, from the influence of this world system, because we want to be in love with Father. If you are a Christian this morning, there has got to be a holy detachment from this world. You can't be busy trying to build your life here on earth. You've got to be busy building your life in eternity, right here, right now, building your communion with Father. And hopefully, we are wise enough with eyes to see through the facade and the lies and the darkness and the deception of this society and see that it's all vanity, it's all chasing after wind, and that serving and loving and worshiping our holy God is really the only way of true life and peace and satisfaction. You will never be happy until you get your eyes off of yourself and make it your life purpose to worship and honor God. You will never be happy. And so if we like to flirt with the world, if we like to play around with the things of the world, if we like to find pleasure in the world, it's very simple. The love of the Father is not in us. And you need to spend more time on your knees with your heavenly Father because the more time you spend with him, the more you will fall in love with him. The more time you spend with him, the more you will see through the vanity and the deception of this society that surrounds us. This society is not passive. The society we live in is aggressive, and it's trying to brainwash us. It's trying to retard our faith. It's trying to distract us from fixing our eyes on Jesus at every turn, bombarding us all through the day. And so he goes on to give some clarity, and he says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So we spent like three weeks on the lust of the flesh. And we saw that the lust of the flesh is striving after, number one, success. Especially in this metro area that we live in, people are driven for success. Nobody wants to be a failure. Nobody wants to be perceived as a failure. But we found out as we studied this that God's definition of success is just the opposite from this world's. The world's definition of success is all about metrics. Bigger is better. More is better. And God's definition of success is obedience. If you are obeying God in your life, regardless of the success, regardless of the results, God calls you a success. Success is obedience to his will. Success is not measured by any earthly standards. And so if you are obeying God this morning, you are a success in God's eyes, completely opposite from the world. Secondly, the lust of the flesh strives after security. We want provision. We'd like to have a million bucks in the bank. We'd like to be retired. Forget that, five million bucks in the bank, right? We want to be provided for. We want to be protected. We want to try to uh, wrap the arm of the flesh around us to have physical security that we can touch and feel and reckon. And we found out that it's vain to trust in horses and chariots. It's vain to trust in the arm of the flesh, that protection and security and provision comes from God and God alone, and our eyes need to be set and fixed on Him. The lust of the flesh strives after satisfaction. And we saw that passage in Ecclesiastes when... Um, 
King Solomon withheld nothing from his eyes, remember? He tried it all, and he said, it's all vanity. It's all chasing after wind. Satisfaction only comes from one place, the presence of God, worshiping God, having a relationship with God, talking with God throughout the day. That's where our satisfaction comes from. And then last week, I think it was, we talked about the lust of the eyes. We talked about the need of guarding the gateway to our soul. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And like I was just saying a moment ago, we are continually bombarded by this world system, by this kingdom of darkness. We need to guard our hearts with all diligence, as Proverbs says. We need to guard the gateway to our soul. And some things we need to abstain from, some things we need to turn away from, and we dare not be like Lot's wife. When God separates us from this world, we dare not look back in remorse and lust and desire. We better be ready to go for God and serve Him absolutely, wholly with our hearts. So Lust of the eyes. Today we're going to talk about the pride of life, and we're going to talk about these three areas of the pride of life. And we'll go through the scriptures in a moment. But the pride of life expresses itself in that desire for self-promotion. We love to do things to get attention, right? Some of us do it very quietly. Some of us do it more prominently. But we want to... I put there, we want to be noticed, the things we do to be noticed, how we dress, how we talk, how we act. We want to be admired, we want to be, con we want to be superior, we want to be respected in other people's eyes. It's amazing, apart from Christ, how much we do just to get that attention. So we promote ourselves. We want to be self-sufficient. I don't need anybody, any help, I don't need anybody. I can make things happen by my own power. I'll fix this. I can, I can handle this. Really? The pride of life ex expresses itself in self-rule. That spirit that says, I will determine for myself what's right and wrong for me. And I'm not going to let any God or any body or any Bible tell me I'm going to rule my own life. So let's talk about these three things this morning. This whole self-promotion some of you are old enough to remember. Remember back in the 50s and the 60s? In the 50s and 60s, psychology was really on the rise. You see it in the movies, you know? Have you ever seen one of those really dark, sadistic kind of black and white movies where if anybody was considered, you know, a bubble off mentally, they'd put them in these horrible uh, asylums? And uh, Steve's with me. He knows about these movies. And uh, it, it's terrible things, you know, where they give them electrical shocks and, you know, experiment with them and put them in straight jackets and you see all of these distressed, tortured faces, just, uh, it's really dark, right? But it, it, during the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, the psychology was really on the rise. It was considered the new science, the new medicine. And uh, you had people like Norman Vincent Peale. Do you all remember him? The older people I know will. He was, a, he was a pastor of the Marble Collegiate Church for 52 years, long time, from 1932 to 1984. This church, this was the church to belong to, man. This was the up and coming message. This is what was contemporary, modern, cool. And he made a real big effort to try to combine ministry, faith, with psychology. And I have to say, it ended up just polluting Christianity to great, great extents. And so much of it we still today are needing to wash out of our minds. He was the author of The Power of Positive Thinking, sold over five million copies on the bestseller list for I, I can't remember how many months. He was president of the American Foundation of Religion and Psychiatry. This next one, I don't know why I put it in there, just for grins. He conducted the marriage of Donald Trump to, is it Ivana, Ivana, Trump? What is it? Ivana, thank you. So I tried twice and I still didn't get it right. 
He also, he was very close to the Nixon family. <laughs> and, uh, all right, Sal. <laughs> he was, <laughs> I'm just teasing. He uh, was very close to the Nixon family. I think he uh, married Nixon's daughter. What was her name? Patricia? Yeah. So, but anyway, I, I'm saying all of that to say, he was one of those very popular, in the know, in all of the right circles. This was, this is just a snippet of his message. Believe in yourself. Have faith in your abilities. Without a humble but reasonable confidence in your own powers, you cannot be successful or happy. And so that was the message. And it, you hear that kind of, bleeding through a lot of Christian messages even today. You know, you, you hear people say, well, God doesn't make any junk. Well, that's true. God doesn't make any junk. But when his creation rebels and sins, the junk makes itself junk. That's what corrupted us. It wasn't God's fault. He didn't make us that way. But what it does is that it, you know, it, it really kind of, uh, deteriorates and erodes the whole principle of repentance, of coming to the place of realizing, I am lost. I am a sinner. There is no good in me. I need to repent and ask God for forgiveness, and I need Him to change my heart. And this really just, it either erodes or just absolutely negates all of that repentance into, I can find greatness in myself. I can find glory. I can take pride in who I am. Can you really? That's what we want to look at. It's bled through to many of the popular teachers of today. This quote, there is a winner in you. You were created to be successful, to accomplish your goals, to leave your mark on this generation. You have greatness in you. The key is to get it out. Again, that humanistic, man-centered theology. Don't just accept whatever comes your way in life. Now just pause for a moment. Think about that. I seem to remember someone saying, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You were born to win. But we don't always win. Do you guys always win? I don't always win. There's sometimes I lose. You were born for greatness. You were created to be a champion of life. And so it, it, it sees, it, it attributes glory and greatness and goodness to man without the cross. And that is, uh, that's the disaster of this kind of message. Jeremiah 17, verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. And that right there is the problem with the whole self-esteem message. It makes your heart turn away from the Lord. Because now I have greatness. I have goodness in me. I don't need to depend upon God. And in fact, God is the one that made me the, this great, so you know, I should use what he's given me. And there's truth mixed and mingled into all of that. You know, when, when you truly repent and surrender your heart to the Lord, that is when God can make the most out of your talents and personality. When Jesus is shining through you, that's when the glory of you being a creation of God really shines. But until there's repentance and surrender to God, our righteousness is as filthy rags, and we're lost and doomed to God's judgment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that poor in spirit means to come to the realization of how destitute you are without God, how there is nothing good or godly in us that we need to be saved Blessed are those who mourn for their state, for their spiritual state, for their sins, for they shall be comforted. But you can't be comforted and forgiven without first the mourning. 
You have to see the condition that you're in. Romans chapter 7, verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. I have the desire to do what's right, but I don't have the ability to do what's right. I don't have it in me to do what's good and right. We've got to come to terms with who we really are. Remember Job? So much of this self-esteem message is taking pride and glory in yourself and who you are. Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I despise myself. Do you want to know how you will know if you've come into the presence of a holy God? If you have truly come into the presence of a holy God, you will cry out, oh God, be gracious to me. I am a man of unclean lips. I need you, Father. I fail so many times. I am so far short of what you've called me to be in the image of Jesus Christ. Father, forgive me. The closer you get to that light, man, the more your darkness and all of the shadows begin to appear. That's how you know when you've been in the presence of God. And it's not that you run away afraid of God. It's that you run to him because you know he will always love and forgive and cleanse and make you whole. But when Job came into the presence of God, he said, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So we have all of these principles that just directly contradict the self-esteem message. Isaiah 57, 15, thus says the, high, the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, and I dwell with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. That's who God dwells with. Not the disciple of self-esteem. He dwells with the contrite and the lowly spirit. Look at this quote from Charles Spurgeon. You are not mature if you have a high esteem of yourself. He who boasts in himself is but a babe in Christ, if indeed he be a babe at all if indeed he be in Christ at all. Young Christians may think much of themselves. Growing Christians think themselves nothing. Mature Christians know that they are less than nothing. The more holy we are, the more we mourn our infirmities, and the humbler is our estate of ourselves. Dave Hunt, heaven is no place for the erroneous belief that Christ died because we are worth it. I've heard that. Have you heard teachers say that? Jesus died for you because you were worth it. Christ's death in our place had nothing to do with our worth, but with the depths of our sin, the demands made by God's justice and his eternal glory. Look at this one from John Calvin. Hypocrisy can plunge the mind of a man into a dark abyss when he believes his own self-flattery instead of God's verdict. And you know what God's verdict is? What is God's verdict on your life before Christ? Just take a look at the blood and the torture and the torment that Jesus received on the cross. That's God's verdict on your life before Christ. That's what we deserved. And that's what we have to come to before we can grow in God and be vessels that bring him glory instead of glory to ourself. Remember, this was the heart of Lucifer in Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend. I will set my throne. I will sit on the mount of assembly. It's that spirit, ugly spirit of promoting myself it can be done in just the little things. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Think of this. Be thoughtful as we read through this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. I don't need God. I can find goodness and glory 
in myself. I can find greatness in me, in just the way that I am. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They exchanged the glory of God for the glory of themselves, and they began to worship themselves. Therefore God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature, the glory of man, the goodness of man, self-esteem, themselves. They served the creature rather than the who? Rather than the creator. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And you think, well, wait a minute. How do we get off onto homosexuality all of a sudden? I think we'll see it here. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God... God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. To do what ought not to be done. You know the biggest problem with homosexuality? The biggest problem with homosexuality is not the perversion of the sexual act. (laughs) That's really not the issue. Now, it is an issue and it's sin, But you know, that's not the issue. The issue with homosexuality is the fact, and and now with all of this transgender, and and I'm going to change my gender, and and now, who was it? Just the other day. Is it Apple? One of those companies, they're they're coming up with with gender-neutral emojicons. So if you are really bothered by your emojicons, am I saying that right? Uh, Go to Apple. I think they've got some new gender neutral stuff for you there this uh this week also coming up i think what's today the 8th i think it's the 15th october 15th is it when um you know president obama gave something like 4.4 acres or something to a memorial to uh homosexuality to to the freedom of gays and so forth and and so when he did that, it became federally protected property. And so they're announcing now that the, the rainbow flag will now fly at, their, at that uh, flag staff, flagpole, in front of this federal. It's, it was in the Huffington Post, and that's going to happen just this week. So our nation is really embracing this. But let me tell you, I didn't finish and tell you the problem with homosexuality. The, the pro- Homosexuality, it's not about the sexual act. It's, it's all about rebellion to God. And instead of saying, I refuse to do what God tells me to do, now they're saying, I refuse to be who God made me to be. And I'm going to create me in my image, what I want, what I desire. And it's kind of like the ultimate rebellion in the heart of man. That's the problem with it. And that's why you you go down through this passage and you see comments like, they did not acknowledge God. They did not give God thanks. They exchanged the truth of God and served the creature more than the creator. That's where this perversion will take you. To where you completely reject God's order of who he made you to be. And now you're going to change yourself into something different in spite of his will for your life. And it creates this perversion, and it escalates it. This is what we come to when we stop giving God glory. You know, not giving God glory, taking glory to yourself, doesn't sound all that bad, right? But look at where it it will take you when we stop living for God and start living for ourselves. Self-sufficiency. This will be a flashback for some of you. You all know who Ari Kelly is? Dwayne, did you ever hear, you know who Ari Kelly is? 
I thought you would. He was kind of like the king of R&B for a while. He was, uh, you'll see it there, he was named number one R&B artist of the last 25 years in 2011. But he wrote this song, and do you all remember this song, I Believe I Can Fly? You better have a good parachute. But look at the words to this song, and this is, I mean, this is the message of our culture. He's singing about this because this is what the society around us believes. He said, I used to think that I could not go on, and life was nothing but an awful song, but now I know the meaning of true love. I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. Now, I think that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what was in his heart or what was in his brain at the time, but I think personally I perceive that as a reference to the hymn Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, remember that? But he's not talking about the same everlasting arms as the hymn. He goes on and he says, if I can see it, then I can do it. If I just believe it, there's nothing to it. And you hear that mantra all the time of just believe in yourself and you can do anything. And it caters to this pride of self-sufficiency. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day, spread my wings and fly away. I believe I can soar. I see me running through that open door. And so it's all about faith in you, believing in you. Apart from God, I have greatness in me. Apart from God, I have goodness in me. Apart from God. Augustine says this, sin is believing the lie that you are self-created self-dependent, and self-sustained. I think he said it very well. The sin, the pride of self-sufficiency. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. Don't think you know what you're doing. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. Let him make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. What is the evil he's admonishing us to turn away from? Being wise in our own eyes, thinking that we are sufficient in ourselves, that we have the power to change our life, to change things, to change circumstances. Jesus said, John 15, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. And so you see these messages, these doctrines are diametrically opposed. This message of self-esteem, self-love versus how we are to relate to God complete opposites, as opposite as light is from darkness. And then lastly, this whole thing of self-rule, that I'm going to determine for myself what is right and what is wrong for me. You know, the, the period of the late 50s through the 70s brought some really bizarre stuff, and that that is when what they now call the postmodern philosophy came about. And the postmodern philosophy, you see it in situational ethics. Um, and the message behind situational ethics, ethics and this postmodern philosophy is uh, there is no absolute truth, but truth depends on the circumstances. And the end really does justify the means. And so as long as the end that you're aiming for is relatively good, then how you get there doesn't matter. <laughs> Some really perverted stuff, right? There's moral relativism. Moral relativism really says there is no absolute right or wrong. Situational ethics at least say that there is right and good depending on the situations. That's still wrong, but moral relativism does away with wrong and right and says whatever feels good, do it. 
It's, it's the whole philosophy that truth is subjective, not objective, that truth is defined by your experience and feelings. Well, what, what makes you feel good? That's truth. That's what's right. That's what's good. Until there's a murderer that says, murdering you makes me feel good. So is that still right? And so that's kind of the absurdity when you move away from the absolute morals of the Word of God and everything becomes now subjective, subject to the circumstances, subject to my feelings. And that's a, that's a really quick overview and obviously tainted. I'm not sure I'm representing everything completely objectively or uh, completely, but... That's basically what they believe and teach, and that's the, that, that is the dogma of today's society. No absolute truth. Depends on the situation. Depends on how you feel. What makes you feel good. And it's that whole self-rule of I will determine for myself what's right and wrong. Well, Judges 17 says it much more simply, verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. No absolutes. Whatever feels good, that's what you do. Psalms 119, verse 4, says it this way, to show the contrast with God's commandments. You have commanded your precepts to be kept how? diligently. It's not up to you and me to determine what's right or wrong. God has already revealed what's right and wrong in his word, and he commands us to keep his precepts. Determining what's right and wrong is above our pay grade. We we don't swim in that lane. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We receive our instructions and we obey explicitly. He is God. We are his servants. We don't determine what's right and wrong. When he says thou shalt and thou shalt not, that is the rule of our life and conduct. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, brothers, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Place your hand, place your body in the hands of God and say, Father, whatever you want for me, I'll do it. Whatever you want for me, I surrender and I obey. That's the only option. Any other option is disobedience and death. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Father, I will do whatever you command me to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. If the title to your body and life was in your name, then you would have a say over what you could or couldn't do. But the title on your life and body belongs to God. He purchased you with the blood of his son. You're not your own. And yet every day we go, hopefully not every day, but too often we walk around as if we possess ourselves. We own ourselves. I can control myself. I can determine what I do and don't do. That's not up to us. We are slaves to God, servants of Jesus Christ. We do as we're instructed. We don't belong to ourselves. Therefore, we don't have the privilege and authority to determine what we do and don't do. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body because we are another person's possession. We don't possess ourselves. Let's stop there for this morning. Father, thank you for your word to us. And Lord, we know that your commandments to us are to give us life. So many times we feel like God's holding out on us or he doesn't want us to be happy or have fun or a fulfilling life. And Father, 
All of your commandments are just for that reason. You love us. Every good thing comes down from you. And any time we operate in the pride of life, of wanting to promote ourselves or wanting to be on our own and self-sufficient or wanting to rule our own conduct, Father, that is death. And we ask that that would be made so abundantly clear. There is no life, no joy, no peace outside of complete submission to you. Father, instead of being proud, we ask that you would humble us and let us become the servants that you called us to be. As we go now, we pray for Paul and Cheryl and for Paul Jr. and for Danny, and we pray for safety as they travel. We pray, Father, that you would prosper their trips, that as they go, they would sense your presence and your anointing on their lives, that as they go, they would know that they go in the will of God for the sake of God, according to your plan and purpose for their life. Father calls them to sense your presence with them. We ask that you bring us back tonight to worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.